Well, if you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does, you can look on with. Let me invite you to open with me to Hebrews chapter 10. So if you need to use table of contents, feel free to do that. Hebrews chapter 10, near the end of the Bible. And today I want to particularly welcome those of you who are watching or listening online because, well, you're the only ones watching or listening to me right now in this particular sermon. So at this moment, on this Sunday, different NBC pastors at different locations are sharing God's word at those locations. And they're all talking about how we are reopening as a church more and more in the, in right now, this week, next week, in the days to come, and the months to come. And many of those reopening plans are pretty specific to those locations. Meanwhile, I am talking to you, those of you who are at home or somewhere else, somewhere besides one of our church locations today. And my assumption is that there may be many possible reasons why you're watching or listening online. You may be a member of NBC and you're traveling and you just wanted to make sure not to miss a Sunday with your church family even while you're away. And if that's you, I just want to say that I am so glad you prioritize not missing a Sunday with your church family. I think that, that says a lot about your heart. I praise God for you joining in this way. Or maybe you're deployed overseas and there's not a church you can attend where you are, so you faithfully gather with your church family, our church family as best as you can every week until you're able to make it back home. Again, I think that says a lot about your priorities. And I want you to know that you are missed, and I pray, we pray for God's blessing on you and your family in this time that you're away, and we look forward to you being back. Or maybe you're watching online because you're sick, or you're not feeling well, or maybe you're bedridden right now, and you would be here in person if you could, but it's either physically impossible or physically unwise for you to be here physically. So. I'm glad that you're able to join in this way. And I pray for God's grace and God's strength, God's healing, God's mercy to be yours in every way during these days. There may be many more reasons why you're not gathered physically with the church right now, but there's one more group I want to specifically mention. And that group is those of you who have gotten into a habit over the last year of not gathering with the church. Knowing that we've obviously encouraged that habit. Like it was just over a year ago when for the first time in many of our lives, we all could not gather together as a church in light of a global pandemic. Everything in society was shut down for presumably good reason to protect one another from a spreading virus that was infecting and taking the lives of many people over many months. And since that time, over a year ago, things have been slowly opening up around us and amidst the church among us. Though our gatherings have involved a smaller number of people with a variety of limitations, whether it's masks or social distancing from one another, and none of that was ideal, but we've taken the position over this last year as a church that it has been good and loving under the circumstances for people of any health condition to feel as safe as possible when we come together as a church. We could have opened up to a lot more people sooner as a church, taken off the mask, decreased the distance, and said, if you have concerns about COVID, you're free to stay home. But that's not what we said. We actually said we want this to be as safe a place as possible for you to come regardless of your level of concern about COVID. I think about one woman in her 80s who came up to one of our leaders here in the lobby and said, I would not feel comfortable being here if you all did not have the precautions and protocols you have in place. Thank you for making this a safe place for me to be with my church. Or I think about the number of people who have gotten COVID, including myself, who have been in a gathering, but because of the, by God's grace, protocols and precautions we've had in place, We've not had a spreading event, which for us as a large church is something we certainly, certainly should give God 
glory for and express gratitude to him for. So we believe it's most loving to every member of our church to have these protocols in place in light of the prevalence of COVID in our country, in light of waiting for months for vaccines to be available to anyone who wanted to get a vaccine. Yet now, we have entered by God's mercy into a new phase in our country where vaccines are available to anyone who wants them, restrictions are being loosened as a result, which means we are adjusting our protocols and our practices to begin moving back toward normal. Now again, those protocols are different across different locations. Like we have different counties, even states represented in our church family. So things are a bit different in, for example, Prince William County, Virginia, and Montgomery County, Maryland which is why different locations pastors today are walking through what reopening looks like at those locations. In some of those locations, registration will no longer be necessary to attend a worship gathering. Temperature checks won't be taking place anymore. Masks will be optional, though various locations will still have designated sections for those who want to keep a mask on and be around others who are wearing masks. So if you live in Metro Washington, D.C., let me encourage you, Go to mclanbible.org, sign up for the e-news at the location that's nearest to you, and every week you will receive all the latest information you need on what gathering looks like in that place. But the reason I'm sharing all of this with you is because I want to say as pastorally as I can, based on God's word, that it's time to break the dangerous habit of not meeting together physically as the church. And I'm using that language intentionally because there's a point in God's word where he uses that exact same language with his people. Some of you may remember earlier this year we did a series called From Surviving to Thriving. Had a couple lemon trees up here and talked about what it takes to nurture growth. And at one point in that series, Pastor Mike and I read from Hebrews chapter 10 and we walked through 12 traits of a biblical church that we talk a lot about around NBC that God has designed for each of us to thrive in our relationship with him. I wanna bring us back to that text, but I want us to pay particularly close attention to the language at the very end of this passage. I'll put it up here on the screen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, basically what verses 19 through 21 there just summarized is the gospel, the good news that God has made a way for us to be reconciled to relationship with him, to be forgiven of our sin by Jesus' death on the cross, resurrection from the grave. In light of that, in light of this good news, verse 22 says, let us, and you're gonna notice three times the author of Hebrews uses this phrase, let us. So this is what God in his word is calling us to do together. So the us is the church here. Let us draw near to God with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promises faithful then verse 24 says let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not so watch this language neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near now, obviously, these verses were not written after a year of global pandemic, but they were written during a day and a time when many followers of Jesus had gotten into the habit of not meeting together. They were neglecting to meet together, and it become the habit of some, which I think makes this text very applicable to our day, knowing that we live in a day where it has become the habit of some, I would say many, again, to an extent we've encouraged that, 
But now we've developed this habit of not meeting together that God in his word warns us against. And it's really interesting, this language, when it says to consider how to stir up one another, and you don't really catch this in the English, but consider actually goes directly to, in the original language, next to one another. And this word consider means to give careful attention to one another, to give, to express deep concern for one another. And when you think about it, I was thinking about just meditating on this text, that's actually the reason we've not gathered together, out of consideration for each other, out of concern for the safety and well-being of each other. Or that's the reason why we've gathered in limited ways with protocols in place that have been uncomfortable for many of us, but we've done it out of concern for each other because we've considered each other. But by God's mercy, things are changing around us. And I don't say that lightly at all. It is by God's mercy that things are changing around us. I look at places like India right now where COVID has been spreading like wildfire and many people are dying, including family members. I think of one sister from India in our church family whose family in India right now is being ravaged by COVID. Or I think about Arlen, who one of our pastors here at Tyson's, who you heard from earlier, he recently went to Cameroon for the funeral of his dad, who had died of COVID, and his dad's brother did the funeral, and then a week later contracted and died of COVID. So by no means is this pandemic over in the world, far from it. But by God's mercy, we're in a part of the world where vaccinations, vaccinations are available, who want or choose to get that, and by God's mercy, we're at a point where as best as we know, loosening restrictions and protocols seems good and right as we consider one another. So for that reason, I want to encourage you and us together as a church family. It's time to break this habit of neglecting to meet together. If you are a part of NBC Church family here in Metro Washington, D.C., I want to encourage you today to begin moving back toward physically gathering with the church as it's appropriate possible at your location. And then if you're not a part of NBC, maybe you've been joining in from beyond Metro Washington, D.C. I hope that joining in during this last year has been an encouragement to you spiritually it has been awesome to have so many people joining in from different states and countries around the world every week. There's a sense in which we have loved that. And our services will continue to be archived. The sermons are on podcasts, tons of resources at mclanebible.org and radical.net. We want to be an encouragement to you and the broader church, but we don't want to be a substitute for what God has designed, a local, physical in the flesh church near you to do in your relationship with him and with others, one another in the church. I realize that saying this may reduce our online numbers, but I, we want far more for you to be in a living, breathing church gathering where you are on a week by week basis. Because this is what it means to be the church. And I realize even that statement may sound foreign to some, outdated even. Many people might think, 21st century, new day, world's been turned upside down. We can just do church from home or wherever else online. Can't we hear God's word and worship and grow in Christ from here? Actually, in a lot of ways that are better for me or my family, for whatever reason? Can't I just do church from a distance? And again, if you are bedridden, or if you are deployed for a time or traveling one week, church from a distance may be your only option. But for most of us, we have the option of gathering physically with a church. And where we have that option, God in his word calls us to meet together. That's the language to 
draw near to God together, to hold fast to our hope together. Let us draw near. Let us hold fast. And let us consider how to stir one another up, not neglecting to meet together. Apparently, according to Hebrews chapter 10, these things can't happen. Drawing near and holding fast and considering one another and stirring up one another to love and good works if we are neglecting to meet together. The implication of this text seems to be clear that God has designed helpful, good things to happen in your life and in others' lives in the church when you meet together. And neglecting to meet together actually leads to unhelpful, dangerous things in your life. Would you just hear this straight from the Word? Knowing that even as I say that, some of you might think, yeah, I'm not convinced that I can't just do church as well from here as if I was there. You may even wonder, are you trying to cajole me into coming back to church? And I assure you, I have no desire to cajole you, as my mom might say, to sweet talk someone into doing something. I only want to encourage you to do something if God in his word is encouraging you to do something. Don't Listen to anything a pastor encourages you to do if they cannot show it to you in God's word. So let's ask that question together. Does God in his word tell us to meet together, to physically gather together as his church in a way that cannot normally be accomplished if we're distant from one another? That certainly seems to be what Hebrews 10, 25 is saying, but let's look a little deeper. Let's go cover to cover in the Bible, and I think we'll see the answer is yes. That from beginning to end in the Bible, God tells his people over the course of century after century after century to physically assemble together for their good and for his glory. It's interesting, even the word for church in the Bible, ecclesia, literally means an assembly. In other words, it's part of the essence of the church to assemble together, which means that if a church doesn't normally assemble, that it's not actually a church. Church, by its very nature, necessitates assembling. And this has been true throughout the history of God's people, even before God's people were a church. Remember when God formed his people, the people of Israel in the Old Testament? He delivered them out of slavery in Egypt. This is what we've been reading about in our Bible reading together as a church family. And he physically gathered them together at Mount Sinai to behold his glory, to hear his word. And then listen to the way the Bible describes that moment when God entered into covenant relationship with his people. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 10, Moses says, And the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words that the Lord had spoken with you on the mountain out of the midst of the fire on the day of the what? Of the assembly. And this word, assembly, becomes the common way that God's people are described all throughout the Old Testament. An assembly, a physical gathering of people. Let me just give you a few examples throughout the history of God's people. You might write them down. Judges chapter 20, verse 2. And the chiefs of all the people of all the tribes of Israel presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 14. And the king turned around and blessed all all the assembly of Israel, while all the assembly of Israel stood. They're assembled together. This is the dedication of the temple. First Chronicles 28, verse 8. Now, therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the assembly of the Lord. That's who God's people are described as, the assembly of the Lord. And in the hearing of our God, observe and seek out all the commandments of the Lord your God. You may possess this good land and leave it for an inheritance to your children after you forever. One more, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. All the people gathered As one man into the square before the water gate, they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, this assembly of God's people. So this was the pattern of God's people all throughout the Old Testament. And what's interesting is, so most of the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew. Most of the New Testament was originally written in Greek. Greek. 
And you'll never guess what the Greek translation of this Old Testament word assembly is. It's ecclesia. The word that the New Testament uses to describe the church. When the Bible describes a local church, God in his word says, here's what a local church is. It's an assembly. It's a gathering of people. Which is why you then see phrases all over the New Testament about the church physically being gathered together. There are tons of places I could show you this. For the sake of time, I'll just camp out in the book that we're walking through right now, 1 Corinthians. Listen to the language that the Bible uses here. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, to be a church involves coming together. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 23. The, if therefore the whole church comes together. See the connection between assembly coming together? Church is described as a meeting together. Listen to 1 Corinthians 14, 19. Nevertheless, in church... Now, he's not talking about a particular building. He's talking about in this assembly, when the church is gathered together. I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. So in church, he's talking about an event, a meeting, a gathering of God's people, what he does in that gathering. 1 Corinthians 14, 28 uses the same language, and we'll study this more when we get to this part of 1 Corinthians about speaking in tongues, but just listen to the language for now. For if there's no one to interpret, let each of them be silent in church, in the assembly, and speak to himself and to God. In church. Now this language makes total sense when you think about what the church is and what the church does. The church is not just a group of isolated individuals distant from one another. The church is a group of people that gathers together and they do things with one another that they can't normally do apart from each other. So just think about those 12 traits of a biblical church that we talk about at NBC. Biblical preaching and teaching. We might think, well, can I just listen to biblical preaching and teaching online? And absolutely you can. I do. I listen to others teach God's word during the week, I would encourage you to listen to as much biblical teaching as will help you grow in Christ. But do you remember that picture among God's people all throughout the Old Testament when they would assemble together to hear his word like it like they did at Mount Sinai, like they did. Let me read again, Nehemiah 8, 1 and 2. All these people gathered as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe, bring the book of the law of Moses. Like, bring out the book that the Lord has commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly. The rest of that passage goes on to talk about how they all heard God's word together in this assembly. Now, one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament, actually, it's a passage I remember reading in my quiet time when God renewed my desire and calling to pastor in a local church, 2 Chronicles 20, 34, verses 29 and 30. Listen to this language. The king, King Josiah, sent and gathered all, together all the elders of Jer- Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the Levites, all the people, both great and small. They're all coming together. And what did he do? He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. They assembled together to hear God's word. They didn't just spread it out in different places. They assembled together to hear it. So with that picture in the Old Testament, then it's no surprise to turn the page of the New Testament and to read in a place like Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. Just read that. Teaching and admonishing one another, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Like that can't happen. Teaching and admonishing one another, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another if you're not with one another. So yes, we can be taught the Bible at different times. But at some point, we gather like God's people have gathered throughout history together to hear God's word. And this has been the pattern of God's people since the beginning of the Bible. The same goes for biblical prayer. Of course, you and I can and should pray all the time alone. 
But from the very beginning of the church, in Acts chapter 4, verse 24, we read this. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord. They start praying. The church was constantly gathering together to pray, to fast. Biblical discipleship involves being together, sharing life together. We've talked before about how Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, gives us a powerful picture of Old Testament discipleship, when the Bible says, these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Obviously, talking about the word like this encouraging one another with the word, helping each other obey the commands of God, that necessitates sharing a life together, being together. Which, by the way, I would say even the mention of children here is one of the things that our location pastors are talking about today that I want to mention to you. As we open up more and more, we're opening up more and more ministry to children, students, those with special needs in different ways at different locations, which requires more and more people in our church family to teach God's word to children and students and those with special needs and to help them grow in their relationships with God. We place a priority as a church family here at NBC on passing the good news of who God is and what God has done on to the next generation, which involves all of us working together toward that end. So I want to challenge you not just to come back to a church gathering, but come back to church serving. Even this summer, if we're going to open up more, we need more people to step up and serve children, students, those with special needs. I want to call every member of our church family to be a part of that work. This involves all of us, single adults, married adults, Young adults, senior adults, with kids, without kids, doesn't matter. We need all hands on deck to serve if we're going to be the church that God has designed us to be, helping each other grow in Christ. Nobody can sit on the sidelines on this thing. Everybody engaged in doing Hebrews 10, meeting together to encourage one another in a way that you can't do from your living room. This is one of the reasons we physically gathered together for biblical discipleship in each other's lives and biblical evangelism. Now again, this is something we can do and need to do in our living rooms, in our homes, wherever we work, wherever we go in the city, wherever we go in the world. Yes, we need to share the gospel, but we also gather together physically to proclaim the gospel and to lead people to Jesus. We invite people who don't know Jesus to come to church to this assembly with us so they might hear the gospel and come to faith in Jesus. I met a young woman the other day who came to to faith in Jesus at one of our outdoor gatherings over this last year. And I think about Colleen, Judah, Nadine, Mumbi, and Jampa, Jampa, a Tibetan refugee from a Buddhist background, all of whom came to Christ through just one of our gatherings a couple of weeks ago. It's biblical to invite people to church gathering, gatherings for evangelism. Listen to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 23 and 20 through 25. I love this passage. If therefore the whole church comes together, so you've got this gathering, and all speak in tongues, and outsiders or unbelievers enter. Again, we're going to study this passage more uh, in the coming weeks as we get to this point in 1 Corinthians. Will it not say, you are out of your minds? But follow this. So we're talking about Outsiders or unbelievers coming in to the gathering of the church. But if all prophesied, an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he's called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. What a picture. Like, may this happen every week. We gather together. You and I bring, invite, people who don't know God, who don't know Jesus, and they come in and they see God being worshipped, they hear God's word being proclaimed, and they see worship around us in a way that says, this is different. God is here. 
And I want to know God, and I want to worship God alongside you. He will worship God, declare God is really among you. God, do this. That happens when? When the whole church comes together. I'd be remiss if I didn't pause at this point and to invite those of you who are watching, listening right now, who, who don't have faith in Jesus, have not come to the point where you've trusted in him as the Savior and Lord of your life, I encourage you. One, I invite you to be a part of our physical ch- church gatherings. Like, come as you're exploring Christianity, as you're thinking about questions of faith, as you're walking through whatever you're walking through in life. And I hope you hear today, and I hope you hear every time that we gather together, that there is a God who loves you so much that he has sent his son to pay the price for the sins of anyone who will trust in his love. That God has made a way for you to be forgiven of all your sins against him. He has made the way for you to have eternal life with him if you will trust in Jesus. We want to proclaim that. We want to sing that every single time we gather together in a way that we hope you will see that God is among us and that you will join us in worshiping him as your life. So biblical evangelism happens when we come together as a church, not just when we scatter together. Then biblical fellowship. Think the 59 one another commands that we see in scripture, almost all of them necessitate being together. Think Romans chapter 12, verse four. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have all the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We're gonna talk about biblical membership in a second, but just kinda see how these go together. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Look at all those things. Those things aren't happening in your living room or from behind a screen. Those things are happening when the church meets together as members of a body, of an assembly. So I'll go ahead and put it up there, biblical membership. That text, one body, many members. To be a part, to be a member of a church is to be a part, a member of an assembly, of a people who come together under, keep going, biblical leadership. We've talked about this before, but think about passages like Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, where God says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. So who are your leaders? God's telling you to obey leaders in the church. Who are they? They're the pastors, elders, overseers, the deacons, the leaders of the assembly where you meet, the people who are keeping watch over your souls. There's so much we could talk about here, but we will be talking about just a couple weeks from now, uh, including some concentrated time uh, in 1 Corinthians, talking about men and women in the church and elders and pastors and overseers in the church. I'll just say at this point, we are working very hard, have been this last year and will be all the more in the next couple months as we start to reopen. We want to get to the point where every single member of the NBC church family is known and prayed for and cared for by a pastor. I hear all the time, I I don't know the elders or the pastors of my church, and obviously it's not possible for every single elder or pastor to know every single person in the church this size, but we are gonna work to raise up pastors all across our church family to the point where every member of this body is known and cared for in a Hebrews 13, 17 kind of way when we meet together. Again, the point for now is, like Hebrews 13, 17 can't happen when we're isolated from one another. The same is true for biblical accountability and discipline. Think about Matthew chapter 18 where Jesus teaches us about church accountability and discipline. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault just between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. So that's happening outside of the gathering of the church. 
If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established, the, uh, the evidence of two or three witnesses, again, outside of the as assembly. But then, listen to this, verse 17, he refuses to listen even to the small group, tell it to the church. The assembly, the people of God gathered together. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. The word Jesus uses for church there is ecclesia, assembly, which is why when you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the Bible's talking about doing this hard, loving work in the church. Listen to the language there. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, who just said what we read in Matthew 18, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Again, ton we could talk about there. We've studied this passage before in 1 Corinthians that should say Five, not 15, four and five. But the whole picture here is this, this process of church discipline and accountability happens when we are assembled as the church. So you're seeing this assembling, gathering together is necessary, not optional, to be who the church is and to do what the church does. Let me show you these last four traits. Certainly this is the case in biblical worship. We've already read this in Colossians chapter three. I'll show it to you one other place as well. Ephesians chapter five, verse 18. And do not get drunk on wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Did you hear that language? Addressing one another. When we sing, we're not just singing to a screen or we're not just singing into the air. Like we sing, yes, songs of praise to God, but we also sing songs of encouragement to one another. With our psalms and hymns and our spiritual songs. So is it possible to worship God on your own, to sing on your own from your living room or wherever you might be? Yes. But God has designed for us to address one another. This is his word in the church through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That can only happen when we're meeting together. And again, this has been the case for God's people throughout history. Tons of places we could go to, but maybe to summarize it, Psalm chapter 95, verse 1, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Let's do this together. Verse 6, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. We do, this is what we do when we meet together. We make noise together. We, and it's more noise than it is when it's just one of us alone. Like we make noise together. We sing loud songs of praise to God. Make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Like in worship, we are meeting together before God. God. I just let that soak in. There's a meeting happening between a group of people, an assembly of people, and God. You know what that, that's called in the Bible? It's called church. An assembly of people giving glory to God. So, be a part of that. That's what God has called his people to be a part of. Let me just add one note here because one of the challenges that I, I think has been new for many families and parents specifically during this season has been having children with you in worship. First in your home and then now even as we've gathered together and children's ministry is still opening up I've seen all kinds of families coming in together with children of different ages, and I realize this has been hard for a variety of moms and dads and families. Even as, like I said, Kids Quest and other ministries starting to open back up, but I just want to encourage you, if I could, moms, dads, 
amidst the challenges from God's word, like I think about Nehemiah 12. I wish I had time to read this whole passage. Maybe one day soon we'll study it together. It's an awesome assembly of God's people together for worship. And it specifically describes how it was all of God's people of all ages. Look at this summary statement. Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 43. They offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced. I could, could have just said all the people. And, and that was implied in the day. But it makes certain to point out that this was everybody and specifically the mention of children there. Like I've got to imagine not every child in that gathering was perfectly well behaved. Let's not have any idealistic picture here. Not every child and the people of Israel, thousands and thousands of people, not every child was sitting or standing there perfectly or singing perfectly. This was a lot of people. I'm guessing this was a mess in a sense, but it was a beautiful mess before God. All of God's people from all ages gathered for worship before God in a way that was honoring him to him. And listen to the rejoiced, rejoiced with great joy. They also rejoiced. And this is not a drag here. This is an awesome picture that resounds far away, rejoicing with joy, even in the middle of the mess. So if, if you're in worship with your kids in the physical gathering and they're making some noises here and there, please hear me saying, we will rejoice with you. One, because we've all been there at some point. At least every parent has been there at some point. And two, because we rejoice that you are prioritizing the spiritual health of your children. If your child has special needs and make noises, makes noises here or there, know that we as a church family are so thankful for you and for that child and all that's involved in you bringing them to church, to the assembly. Particularly when you think about how Jesus welcomed the children to himself. He said the kingdom belongs to such as these. Now, to be clear, I mentioned this earlier, we're working toward opening up more specific ministry opportunities for children, students, those with special needs in our access ministry. Our Bible reading tomorrow is in Psalm 78. We will, we must, as an NBC church family, prioritize passing the gospel on to the next generation. That's a core conviction we have. But even as part of that conviction, don't underestimate biblically the beauty and the value of all God's people together in worship. So, and, and I, I would mention one other thing, even as we open up programs for children, remember that we need people, including parents, to serve, which may involve worshiping with your children in a gathering and then serving other children or in some other way in the church while your children are, are in a more specific age-focused ministry opportunity. The whole point to come back to, God is designed for his people to assemble together for worship before him. Then to celebrate biblical ordinances as part of our worship. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. We baptize when we come together because baptism is a picture of identification, not just with the person of Christ, but with the body of Christ. And the Lord's Supper happens. We're going to study this in a couple weeks in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, but verse 18 and verse 33 both say when you come together as a church. This is why we've not participated in the Lord's Supper online, but only in person. Because biblically, as best as we can tell, it seems to be a physical meal that the physically gathered people of God take together when they come together as the church. Biblical ordinances. Then the last two traits of a biblical church. Biblical giving. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. Concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do on the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so there will be no collecting when I come. So in this picture in 1 Corinthians, it seems pretty clear there was an expectation for giving to be a part of, so this collection, be a part of the gathering of the church each week. We'll talk about more in this text. There's so much to come in 1 Corinthians when we get to the end of this book. But for now, the final trait of a biblical church is biblical mission. So 
Obviously, this happens as we're making disciples of the nations, going places where the gospel's not yet gone. But in the Bible, let me ask you this question. Where does it start? This impulse to go to the nations, this sending out of missionaries to other places, where does it start? Look at Acts chapter 13, verse two. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, in this gathering of the church, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Biblical mission begins when the church gathers for worship and prayer and fasting and the Holy Spirit speaks in that gathering in ways that leads to the spread of the gospel among the nations. Are you getting the picture here? I just take an honest look at God's word. The church cannot be who God has designed the church to be. The church cannot do what God has designed the church to do. We just looked at all these traits of a biblical church. This can't happen if followers of Jesus neglect meeting together. If they, verse 25, neglect to meet together as had become the habit of some. Which is why, starting particularly today, based on the whole of God's word and specifically Hebrews chapter 10, I wanna call us to draw near to God with a true heart and full assurance of faith, and our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water, to call us to hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And I wanna call us to consider one another, how to stir each other up to love and good works by not neglecting to meet together, as has become a habit but encouraging one another as we meet together. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. In the days to come, let's start physically meeting together again as the church on Sunday whenever possible. Let's start meeting together again in groups. Go to mcleanbible.org, go to the location nearest you, start exploring how to re-engage in regathering. Or if you're not in Metro Washington, D.C., do this with a local church where you live. You know, I mentioned the last time we were in this text in the middle of a series on from surviving to thriving, and we used these two lemon trees, and one of those lemon trees we neglected, and the other we nourished, we fed, we gave it sunlight, the other one we didn't give anything to, we put it in the dark, and we saw the difference over just one month of one tree being neglected and the other one being nourished. But at the end of that series, one of our members volunteered to take both trees, including the neglected one, to try to nourish it back to life. And we said, it's all yours, and I wanna show you a picture of what happened as a result. Now, if you saw that tree from when we gave that tree to this member, you would be shocked right now. Like, that's that's pretty impressive. This lemon tree growing in the middle of winter in Metro Washington, D.C. And I, I wanna share that picture with you because I know for all of us this has been a hard year in so many ways. And it's pretty safe to say that many of us have found ourselves withering in certain ways and certain maybe many days, in part by nature of not being able to do all that we're designed to do as followers of Jesus for ours and for others' spiritual health. But by God's mercy, we now have the opportunity to start nourishing that which has been withering, to meet instead of neglecting to meet, to start doing again what God has designed us to do as a church, as the assembly of followers of Jesus that we are, as the family of brothers and sisters in Christ that we are. So let's take the steps together and serve and grow.
in all the ways God has designed us to do. Will you pray with me? And then hang on after we pray because I want you to see something really important before we close. But would you pray with you now? Oh God, I thank you for every single person who is listening or watching online right now. I thank you for all the different circumstances, amidst all the different circumstances they're repre- they're rep- they're, they represent that they have chosen to be a part of this gathering right now online. God, I pray that you would make the way for as many of them as possible to begin to connect, reconnect, in many cases, with the assembly called your church with the coming together, the meeting together that you've designed for your church. I pray that you would lead, guide, direct, and bless that process of reconnection in ways that lead to flourishing in the days to come for each of them individually, for families, and God, I pray in ways that will lead to the enjoyment of you and all that you've designed for our lives as members of your church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.